Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to what is now the 16th uh, edition in the Coffee Microcaps morning meeting series. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome everybody along to this morning's meeting. I'm just quickly going to run through some uh, introductory slides, and then we're going to get straight into it with our first presenter. So my name is Mark Tobin. I'm the founder of Coffee Microcaps for anyone who hasn't joined us here before. Uh, compliance and disclaimer. Um, just to give you an overview of the structure for anybody who hasn't joined us in, in one of our previous meetings, uh, the session is an hour long, broken into a 30 minute slot for each company. We've got two companies presenting, uh, roughly a 20 minute press on and we leave 10 minutes open for Q&A at the end. If you do have any questions, please type them in the Q&A box rather than in the, the chat function. It just helps manage the, uh, the question and answer session uh, more effectively. Please note the webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the Coffee Mitre Caps YouTube channel um, probably sometime tomorrow. So if you want to watch back uh, one of the recordings or, or you can't stay for the whole thing, uh, please check out our YouTube channel for that. Uh, if you want to follow Coffee Microcaps, uh, Twitter is the best place to get us. As I said, YouTube for recordings of all the webinars, uh, LinkedIn for some additional long form content that I produce. And I also run a weekly paid newsletter, which can be accessed via the Substack platform. Uh, up first, we're going to have Mr. Brendan Malone, CEO of, of Raise Invest Australia and one of the co-founders of Raise. And then following that, um, I'd like to have uh, the chairman of Nutritional Growth Solutions Limited, Mr. Brian Leadman, will be joining us from Perth. And without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand over to Brendan, our first presenter. All right. Thank you, Mark. Can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly, Brendan. I'll let you know when I can see the, the cover slide of your presentation. Okay, let's have a look. Why isn't that not working? You can't see it yet? Yeah, I can see your cover slide now, so you're ready. You're good to go, Brendan. Perfect. Thank you. Good morning, Mark. Um, and to all who have joined us for a coffee uh, this morning and a chat about microcaps on this call. Great to be here this morning and be part of the Coffee Microcaps Morning Meeting. My name is Brendan Malone, CEO uh, of Raise Invest Australia and Group Chief Operating Officer for our ASX listed entity, Raise Invest Limited, which has the ASX ticket code RZI. I'd like to start off this morning with a little overview of the Raise business and how we got to where we are today. I will then step through a presentation focused mainly around the full the financial year or full year 2020 position and then wrap up with some more recent metrics on the business that will also form part of the AGM that will be held later this morning. Don't worry if I speak too fast, everything I talk about is already publicly available information and can be found on our Investor Centre website, which is www.raiseinvest.com.au. Um, and I know Mark is recording this and will also be, and this will also be published, uh, as Mark mentioned, on the Coffee Microcaps, Micro, Microcaps YouTube channel. So let's get into the story so far. The Raise app was first introduced to the Australian market in 2016, following a partnership with a US company called Acorns Grow Inc. At this point in time, we were known as Acorns Grow Australia. What happened next was a positive surprise. The concept of being able to save and invest virtual loose change had instant appeal with the Australian consumer. We saw a rapid uptake uh, of our customer numbers growing by the thousands every month, especially among the young millennials. Fast forward to 2018, we rebranded to Raise Invest Today, which is what we are known as and listed on the ASX. Many of our customers who, are joined, who joined in 2016 remain extremely active and loyal with us today, with millennials continuing to be the mainstay of the business. At the start, Rave was set up to enable customers to invest their virtual loose change, provide an easy and a simple access to the Australian market, or the modern, modern day equivalent of a piggy bank. Today, we are so much more than that, with customers now able to choose from a multitude of product, services, and investment options. We have a clear, transparent and well-defined growth strategy. The first of this two-pronged strategic growth pillar 
is the growth of our domestic business here in Australia. During the past few years, we've successfully grown revenue per customer by continually expanding our range of products and services to include uh, Raise Invest Super, Raise Rewards, which is our cashback program that invests into your Raise Invest account or your Raise Super account when you shop with one of our 250 odd brand partners. And we recently launched a co-branded bundle MasterCard with our partner Flexi Group. On the investment front, we offer seven options or seven portfolios, five funds that range from conservative to aggressive. Um, and we continue to grow the product offering here. The sixth of our portfolios has an ESG or responsible focus, responsibility focus. And our seventh called Sapphire, which was recently launched in May, 2020, has a weighting towards Bitcoin for those with a taste for the alternative asset class. Our strategy of adding products and services to grow revenue per customer reflects our focus on becoming a diversified financial services company, a genuine alternative to the traditional financial institutions. However, new products alone will not drive revenue. From, from day one, we recognize that all our products had to be underpinned by a total commitment to customer service, a genuine service model that becomes customer engagement, especially via social media. Sorry, Brendan, just to cut in for a second quickly. Um, your slides aren't moving from one to the next, sorry. Uh, no, I'll just give you a quick update first. Oh, okay. It's, it's a very quick overdate, update of the business of where we got to today, and then I'm going to step through and talk about FY20, if that, that's okay. Mark, that's good? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Um, so what was up to, uh, our strategy of adding products and services is, 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 is around the growth of revenue per customer. We are committed to offering the best possible customer service because we recognize that today's young customers have the potential to be loyal raised customers for life. Uh, just to wrap up the strategy, the second pillar on our strategic growth plan is Southeast Asia. Our journey into Southeast Asia first began in Indonesia, where we've been operating since 2019, and in 2020 into Malaysia. We have been extremely fortunate to work with PMB, a large asset manager based in Malaysia, who has a very strong network through Southeast Asia and see RAISE as a key part to their digitalization. We recognize that these countries represent enormous opportunities with large established populations of technically literate young people and fast growing economies. The business model repli replicates Australia. We're working hard to increase revenue per customer and accelerate the revenue growth faster than actual customer growth. Indonesia is a unique market that is growing at a significant pace. The fact that we have a license and a footprint in the capital of Jakarta has established strategic, part st strategic relationships and partnerships, ensuring we're well positioned to roll out further innovation in the, in the near future. In Malaysia, a partner PMB, which boasts st strategic relationships and business oper operations throughout the entire Southeast Asia region, is expected to support our expansion into additional countries such as Thailand and Vietnam, which are both underway. In just four years, RAISE has delivered impressive growth, whether measured by funds under management, active customers or revenue. We believe this is because we have a, genuinely, a genuine unique platform of products and services that appeal to the younger generation. We are confident that we can continue to deliver on our strategy as, well, as defined um, both in our prospectus and continuing in our investment decks today with our expansion into Southeast Asia. So Mark, that was just a quick introduction. Now let's look at the presentation, which will then be followed by questions. And I'm sure if I run out of time or drag on, Mark will pull me up on that. So looking at the slide deck now on the screen, guys, just a quick, quick update or quick reminder of what the RAISE platform is. It's a mobile first both on Android and iOS um, investment uh, product for Australian customers, for customers here in Australia, Indonesia and Malaysia. Uh, there is also a web app version of it for people that don't want to do it on their mobile phone. So in Australia, we have, um, we offer seven portfolios, as I mentioned. Uh, and what that means is there's seven predefined strategy uh, portfolios that offer it, that offer a difference of ETFs, all the ETFs here, um, are listed, are quoted on the ASX, and they're issued with the likes from the likes of iShares, Russell, Booty Shares, and State Street. Th those portfolio and portfolio blends are all listed on the PDS and are listed on our website as well if anyone wants to look further. 
So the Australian business kicked off May, it was the, was the first launch. Then we launched into Indonesia and Malaysia, as just mentioned. In Australia, a lot of our, cust a lot of our product development is driven by our customers and what our customer feedback has been like. Uh, so we first originally launched Raise Invest um, and our customers were asking us, what about super? We want the ability to see our super in the palm of our hands with the ease of what we're seeing with the Raise Invest product. So we, we built the Raise, Raise Invest super product offering, which was launched in July, 2018. Uh, we also then, um, customers realized that something like Raise Rewards where one of our 250 odd partners will put money back into your Raise Investment account as in a cash back program uh, was, was more relevant to something like a loyalty points program. And we've built out that Raise Rewards program over the last year to over 250 uh, partners. Um, just on the 2020 highlights, um, I think the main point I'd like to raise here is that when you look at our customer growth here in Australia of 15% year on year, um, you, you look at our revenue from our micro investing platform. Customers went up 15%. However, their, our revenue doubled 100%. Um, and our average revenue per customer actually increased 71% year on year. So uh, um, unlike transactional type businesses, uh, you know, some of the buy now pay laters out there, to double their revenue, they have to double their customers. Uh, and the way we're focusing and, and driving the, Australian, the business here in Australia is to drive the revenue per customer and not necessarily customer growth. Our customer acquisition model is not a, not a customer growth at all costs. We strategically look at the budgets. We can adjust them in a real-time basis. Um, so back, back on that, we own the tech stack that drives this platform here in Australia. And what that tech stack does is it does everything from the front end app that the customers see uh, to lot full live marketing. So it's tapped into the social channels that we look at. And then off the back of that, under the, under the water or the back end of the engine, does everything from funds administration to trading to um, trade confirmation. So if you do trade today, you put $5 in today uh, into one of the portfolios. By the end of the day, you'll have a trade statement like you would if you bought it through a broker to say what you bought, what were the prices. So they get a daily confirmation, a monthly statement, and then an end of year tax statement, which is all driven from our own stack. Um, so the, the 2020 was such a, it was a very good result back off the res, showing the resilience of our business model, the customer loyalty, and also the unique nature of the platform. It was a remarkable achievement to get those customer growth numbers at 15%, but also increase the revenue at 100% through 2020. And especially with the COVID pandemic um, impacting both the, the economic markets, uh, the volatility and the uncertainty by so many millennials and their jobs uh, face losing their jobs over this period. So we're very confident, very happy with the way the business operated through this period. Um, just looking at the, across the bottom line of the, of the boxes there, uh, outside of Australia, we've, um, we've increased customer numbers in Southeast Asia with, as I said, uh, Indonesia went live in September 2019 and Malaysia actually went live on the 1st of June this year. So that's all happened during this pandemic, which has been a big achievement from the teams based up there. We have teams in Jakarta and also in Malaysia. They've got about 10 staff each um, constantly working with us here at the, in the Sydney office uh, from a group point of view. The Raise Invest Super product uh, saw a 45% increase in funds under management, um, about the same on the... Uh, uh, customer number basis there. Uh, what's important about the Raise Invest Super product is we only market it to our existing customer base, which keeps the cost of acquisition obviously down very low. Um, when I, we know out there that a lot of super funds or financial institutions can have a cost of acquisition for customers sort of in the hundreds and, and some of them into the thousands, depending on the actual financial product. So that's, that's key for us is the low cost of acquisition there from our super customers, but also increases and, and creates that lifetime value uh, of a customer. Um, on a balance sheet point of view, we are well capitalized. We have $30 million in the, in the bank. And if you look at our last 4C, which is on our investor center and, and posted on the ASX, we have uh, about 21 quarters at our current cash rate burn, um, which we're comfortable with. Uh, and I, I, just as a sideline, there is, amount of, there is an amount of $2.5 million ring fenced out of that 13 million that we must hold for regulatory capital here in Australia under our uh, we own our own AFSL license and we have the obligation to have red capital there. 
Moving through, there's, a, there's just an example of the growth on, on the revenue per customer at 30 June, it was about, it was $38.20. It's up around $50 now. Um, I'll, I'll get back to that later on the later slide, but there's continued growth uh, with the different product offerings that we offer to keep our customers engaged, relevant uh, and with us. Uh, revenue is a key driver. Um, as I said, it's, it's about revenue growth and not so much about customer acquisition at all costs. There's our, what we like about our business model is that we have a diversified stream of uh, revenue coming from the maintenance fees, uh, which is the $2.50 per month. If your account balance is less than $10,000, we have an account fee model, which is 27 and a half basis, basis points paid per annum, per annum paid monthly on account balances over $10,000. We have some advertising, which is at 30 June, we had 228 uh, reward partners on it. It's up over 250 now. Um, so they pay away some money for being on our platform, uh, which is key. And then we also have a netting revenue stream, which is outlined further in the PDS if, if there's any questions or anyone wants to know more about that. Quick slide on the portfolio return. So whilst they are passive portfolios, uh, we've been quite um, lucky that the, the performance has been decent. Um, over the period, and we sort of in the last two years, we're sort of in, we're beating the Chant West benchmark across portfolios. Um, a lot of people ask about the average account balance. I think when we first launched, a lot of people saw us as a toy for investing. Um, as we can see, the, the, the balances are getting quite high. Uh, at 30 June, the average balance was $1,700, and the average balance in the super um, super accounts was $25,000. We have seen that uh, the invest normal investment account increased to about $2,000 of an average account balance now. Uh, however, the raised super with the COVID early release has seen that average balance drop back down to about 22 and a half from the 25,000. 25, Positiveness, the, the positive signs through the business is we've had net inflows uh, of funds under management despite the market, uh, which shows our engagement uh, with our customers. Prior to the pandemic, a lot of investors would ask me what happens in a market downturn. The biggest, one of the biggest keys to the business is financial education for our customers. Um, and we've managed that previously through something like Brexit and Trump and what that did to the volatility in the market. When the pandemic hit in February, March this year, we continue that engagement and education and, and provided our customers with the opportunity to um, stay with us. Now on that point, there is seven offerings of a portfolio. One big thing through the volatility is that for your $2.50 and the average account is, is less than $10,000, so it's the $2.50 a month, we have a, what we call a rebalancing or a switching uh, mechanism, which means I can move from my conservative portfolio to the aggressive portfolio or vice versa as many times as I like during the month for that one-off monthly fee. Um, so as I said, super's grown. You can see the, the, the growth graph there in super. Um, and we've actually got an award tonight, award ceremony tonight for our super product where we're a finalist in the FinTech Awards, fingers crossed. Uh, so just to bring it back up to more current numbers, uh, these slides will be presented at the AGM later this, later this morning in an hour. Uh, the key metric since 30 June, just to show the continued growth and engagement, our active global customers are up 24%. The funds under management are now 561 million. Uh, which is up 12% since 30 June. Um, and the super has been up again uh, with the average account balance, as I mentioned, for uh, the raise accounts over uh, up 11% or uh, up um, over $2,100. Um, we have seen a good increase in engagement in customers since 30 June with the Sapphire portfolio with the recent rally in Bitcoin, where the Sapphire portfolio allocates uh, up to 5% or 5% of your portfolio weighting can go into to Bitcoin and we use Gemini out of New York State as the custodian for our Bitcoin um, assets. Um, the execution and consistency of a clear defined strategy. As I said, Australia is all about growing, gr continuing to grow our customer base, increasing the revenue per customer, uh, and we will do that through new products and services to improve customer engagement. Um, the last slide, we'll have a quick chat on what products are coming out uh, at the end of the day, increasing the lifetime value for customers. The Asian growth continues. We really want to focus on Indonesia and Malaysia. 
Um, on that basis, George Lucas, our Managing Director and Group CEO, will be heading off on the 1st of December up there to sort of really drive the Indonesian and Malaysian businesses for the next few months. Um, and as I mentioned, Thailand and Vietnam are in talks to, to do further increased expansion there. I won't go on about this, uh, the, these, these couple of slides here, because so I'll open it up for questions in a sec. Um, there's, a, there's a quick update on the Australian slides there. Um, again, they're on the AGM pack that's been released on the ASX and will be on our investor centre at the moment. Um, so continued engagement, and we're very happy with engagement over this period as the market volatility, but the market rallies presently. Indonesia, some really, really good growth there. Um, and you know, whilst there is still some development, it, to, to me, the product in Indonesia is very basic um, as, as we want to build out the product offering to get it to this stage of Australia. Um, it's just a process that we're going through. Uh, so there's lots more to come there and the opportunity is huge. Malaysia's kicking some really good goals up there. The team's working very hard. Uh, customer signups you know, since, the, since the 1st of June, 107,000 signups. Um, PMB, when we had an official launch on the 22nd of July, said to the press that they'd be happy with 60,000 signups by the end of December. Um, we're very happy that we're 107,000 signups to date. So they have to readjust their forecast. Uh, focused areas I've spoken about, um, again, Australian business. I think what I'd like to add here very quickly is the Australian business. We've got two big product developments coming out that have been mentioned uh, in the press. The first one is our customised portfolios. So as we get these millennial customers in, we want to take them through a journey. We've got them coming in at the Raise Invest product. We've got them sticking with us for a Raise Super. We need to fill that gap in the middle. So we've created what we call customised portfolios which will offer about 15 or 16 ETFs quoted on the ASX plus Bitcoin, and the customers can then weight their own portfolios, i.e. some of them ask for a better exposure to the NASDAQ or US, uh, the S&P 500, so they can weight them uh, to their like. That should be released early in uh, calendar year or early next year, uh, first quarter next year. We're also looking at... Uh, onboarding self-managed super funds here in Australia as the product at the moment is only available for individuals here in Australia. We've had a lot of requests for that. Um, people see it as a, self-managed super funds can see it as an easy way to uh, add to their investment portfolio or investment strategy in their self-managed super fund, especially with the low cost model, but also the portfolio returns that I mentioned previously. Um, that their key investment highlights is pretty much a repeat of the first slide, but it just sort of adds a bit more colour uh, to everything. I think um, I think now, Mark, we'll open it up to questions. Okay, right. we have uh, a few, so we'll try and get through them as quickly as possible. Um, what one or two that are emailed in ahead of time? I'll just get to those maybe quickly. Um, uh, why did you leave the Acorn partnership and uh, and the brand and and kind of? start to start to start to raise brand yes good question um so it was a 50 50 joint venture with the us team um they started to take the their product down a route that we didn't see fit for the australian business so we sort of came to an agreement uh there was sorts certain sections of the joint venture that they weren't um helping us out with like they should have uh, but they also saw, they also set up as a joint venture so to see that if they did need to raise some money, they could sell down the joint ventures in, in other countries. They were due to go live in three or four other countries at the same time as Australia, but never managed to get them off the ground. So that the only expansion they had was down in Australia. There was a bit of competing noise down here with uh, Acorns as an investment brand due to others out there in the market. Uh, so we saw that opportunity to break away from the US business but also change the name at the same time. Okay, great. And then uh, another one, um, what's the lifetime value slash customer acquisition cost ratio for the Australian business? I don't know if you have that figure off the top of your head or if you calculate it. Yeah, it's, um, the lifetime value continues to grow and we, we sort of, we're in such an early stage there of the super product because it is such a, a, a stickier business. But we're aiming to get a lifetime value of the customer sort of up over a thousand. Uh, so let's break it down. I, I want to get the average revenue per customer to a stra to start with at hundred dollars here in Australia. It's currently sitting just under fifty or just on fifty. Um, the cost of acquisition of a customer varies. We we see sixty percent of our customers come through organic or word of mouth. 
uh, which is also provides us with a better, stickier customer. Uh, we do pay for a cost of acquisition uh, of customers through our YouTube, uh, through our Facebook, Instagram, um, and a bit on Google and Play. Uh, and that cost of acquisition this week sitting just at about twelve dollars. So that's a very, very low cost of acquisition. It's actually a bit higher than I expected. Back in the day, it was about two dollars fifty, three dollars. But as the inventory gets more expensive in the market, and that's where I, I think it's key that our systems talk to our marketing channels uh, on a daily basis so we can monitor that cost of acquisition and you know, cost of in inventory increases with something like the elections, budgets, et cetera, so we can turn it off very quickly if it sort of gets out of control. Okay. And then the age cohort of your active customer base, uh, you know, is there a turn away when you know, some of those earlier customers get a beholder to, I guess, more mainstream savings investment platforms? There, I won't say a massive. I mean, the average churn at the moment is about one or just under one and a half percent per month, uh, which is pretty much in line with any sort of retail money out there. Uh, the, the, we have 74% of our customers are aged between sort of 24 and 35. Um, there's, there's probably 80% of them are under 45. Uh, but what we're trying to do with the business and the offering is we're getting them at, a, at a, what I call a cradle stage. So that's the 18 plus. Then we've got the super product. So we want to take them on this journey and they can be loyal raised customers from cradle to grave. Um, so the super product does that. The customised portfolio now will, will, will hopefully fix that, that middle age bracket uh, and keep the engagement there. And as we get this customised portfolio up and running, offering the 16 ETFs plus Bitcoin, um, we'll look to open the platform even larger. And, and not sure how, how that'll look like, but we'll do some testing and, and um, get the feedback from the customers. Okay, I mean, you can probably solve this, but I'll ask it anyway from the segmentals in the annual report. But a question on what level of revenue do you need to make the core Australian business profitable? Profitable is not the word I like to use. Cash flow positive. The Australian business is cash flow positive at the moment uh, and, and was for the FY, well, coming towards the end of FY20, the, the, the months were cash flow positive. Uh, as per the four C's. So the Australian business is cash flow positive. We won't be profitable for a while. We have um, our tech stacks on our balance sheet and we have some amortization shelter there for a few years, but it is key from a, from a cash flow point of view that we reinvest it into the business. Um, and therefore there is a cash burn in the last four C or, or there's a cash burn on a monthly basis uh, because of the money that we're spending up in Indonesia and Malaysia. And then a question, how does Reyes communicate with clients, you know, i.e. monthly FUM report or um, I guess how they're tracking? Yeah, so it's all mobile first. So it's real time live in the app or there's an 18 minute delay on the prices. So but at the end of, the each, end of each day, we see, we can track and see customers logging in to see their performance. Uh, we give them a daily confirmation. So if you do trade or invest, either deposit or withdraw on a daily basis, they'll get a, a statement inside the app. They get a monthly statement, which is due, comes out about three days after the month end. Um, and then we also provide an annual tax statement, which we got out 16 days into J July this year. But mainly it's real time. They can understand what their portfolios are going real time. I mean, we have a database in Australia of over 930,000 people signing up. Um, so we target them on emails, in-app messages, push notifications. So it's constant engagement. And I mean, you've got the three and another, uh, the email questions. Um, how many customers are kind of using all three verticals? You know, they're coming in, invest, they've, they've um, set up a super one. You know, might be their primary one or their only one. And they're, you know, actively using the rewards offerings. Have you got a stat on that? I think the question uh, for the, the, the cross sell or the, the cross um, usage across the customer base. No, well, that, that's exactly what we're working on now is that further engagement or, or deepening, deepening customer engagement. Um, the super take up, to be honest, has been a bit slower than we expected um, because it is a bigger decision and the, and the f feedback and the focus groups are telling us that. Um, so, I mean, we're cash flow positive in the Australian business. We only have about one and a half or two percent of the customers, active customers, using Super, and then about four or five percent are using the Raise Rewards. So what what are, what's exciting for me is that if we can drive that engagement and get them using it, 
there's you know the system scalable there's no additional costs for that everything will drop through uh through the pnl okay so it, it is all about you know i could go and acquire new customers but there is a certain number of customers there that aren't using all functions which will help drive the revenue per customer massively and we ran out of time. There was another question, but we, I'm conscious that I want to get on to, to Brian, who's, uh, who's already on here with us. So, Brendan, thank you very much. And um, I'm now going to hand over to Mr. Brian Liebman, the chairman of Nutritional Growth Solutions. Great. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, so, Brian, if you want to share your screen. Um, and I'll let you know once the cover slide is up. Um, and yeah, just maybe go to slide share mode, Brian. Yep, perfect. You're ready to go, Brian. Investment presentation, and we are a new company to the stock exchange. We only listed a few weeks ago, and we are creating scientifically formulated nutritional shakes and snacks with functional benefits to help kids. And we've got a suite of various products. The one in the middle there, Healthy Height, is the product that's currently for sale, and uh, there are various channels that that product is being sold in. We also have other products in development, which I'll talk to later. Um, one thing that's particularly unique about this company and the main reason why I wanted to be involved in it in the first place is that if you go to supermarkets and pharmacies around the world, there's a huge amount of aisle space that's dedicated to nutritional type supplement products. And we've all seen them in Australia. They're, they're dominated by companies like Blackmore's and Nature's Own and Swiss. Um, in the global market, the, probably the biggest player would be Nestle. That is the biggest player. And they all have various products, which one thing in common for all of them, none of them have ever been clinically tested. So they make various claims that they can say that it's good for this and good for that. But then none of them are actually clinically tested. And there's probably a reason for that. Um, there's a saying here in Western Australia where I'm from in mining space, which is don't ruin a good mining tenement by drilling it. And I think in the case of the Blackmores of the world, why, why ruin a product that's selling well by having to prove that it actually works? That's not the space that I want to be in. And I think that Healthy Height could have had a very successful product simply by making the claims that they do in terms of increasing the rate of children's growth and height. Um, but they actually did the extra step, which is to prove the product actually works. And I thought that was very unique and certainly something I've never heard of before. And it was actually uh, developed and proven through the Schneider's Children Medical Center in Israel, which is their largest and most uh, famous hospital in, in Israel. So it's been uh, clinically tested it's been um, published in medical journals. They're targeting very, very large growth markets, namely the US and China, but there's other markets we'll be going to as well. Uh, we are growing our distribution channels. We're presently sold through Amazon, but we are also expanding into other channels, which you'll see announcements to come in respect to that. And we also have new products in development. So we're coded for insurance as well in the United States. So it's a Medicaid rebate. So the cost associated with the product, which is not that dear, um, is actually subsidized by the US government as well. Now, this is the corporate structure. Uh, this is actually as of the day we listed at 20 cents about three weeks ago. The share price is presently 35 cents. So it's got about a $30 million market cap. We raised $7 million. It was uh, the application for listing was um, three times oversubscribed. So it was a very successful IPO. I think it actually debuted at 38 cents a share when it actually came on. 
Um, there's been a bit of profit taking here and there along the way, but it's still stopped holding steady at about 35 cents. And that's without any substantial news that we, we haven't put any particular news of any substance to this point. Uh, we have no debt. <clears throat> the company is effectively cash flow neutral at this point. Um, so we're not losing money, but we expect to make a lot of money going forward. And there's not many shares on issue. We've got a good board of directors led by myself and Laurent Fendel, who's actually based in Israel. And uh, we have um, long-term substantial shareholders, most of whom are escrow for two years. Now the sales growth for the company has been quite exceptional. Uh, I might add that when the company was first started, they did a deal with GlaxoSmithKline for the sale and distribution of the product in India. That was a 3 million US dollar deal. It was, a, it was a cash payment up front. There's no royalties, there's nothing ongoing there, but the Indian market is close to us um, given since we did that deal. But this is the sales for the products purely from Amazon and Shopify in the United States. You can see there's a significant lift in sales. That trend is expected to continue going forward particularly as we move into new sales channels and new regions. So the market is a very large one. I mean, we should call this really the nutraceutical market. It's a food type product. We're focused definitely, um, we're focused definitely on the infant formula. Actually, I'll just correct one thing. I said the $3 million deal at GSK was actually 14 million. So I understated that, I apologize. So with respect to the market is a very large one and the pediatric space is something that I think is a big space for us because, um, well, it's actually not pediatric, it's actually in the three to nine year old space. So the pediatric market is a big one, but I think that's pretty busy with respect to products that are milk based products. We know that the Chinese love to buy Australian milk based products because they're better and so forth, but I'm interested in the three to nine year old space. And that's the space that Healthy Height is presently sitting in. And we got to expand that into the teenage market as well. But this is a very, very large market for us to be in. And it's not a crowded space by any means. So children's height is a major concern for parents around the world. Um, obviously, we all want the best for our children. We want them to grow taller, faster, uh, but we want them to do it in a very healthy way. And there's nothing in our products whatsoever that's uh, the synthetic. It's all natural and it works. So our goals is, uh, is to help children grow in confidence. Um, I've talked about the Schneider Institute. Uh, there's a big unmet need for this. And we're actually leveraging decades of uh, medical research, particularly from the, from the uh, Schneider Institute. So these are the publications, just a snapshot of where they've been published. Um, this is very important in terms of um, getting credibility for your product. We've certainly been published in dozens of articles and it is a unique product. So in terms of the formula, this, as I said, there's nothing synthetic in there. It's actually just a very clever mix of healthy fats, proteins and carbohydrates. They are a, um, a combination that works. Um, I'm not going to make the claim here today that this product is gonna work and, and increase the height or rate of height of growth for children in, in every case. Uh, the problem for kids in today's world is that their diet is lacking in many areas. And this is a reflection of the modern diet. So if the child is getting absolutely everything they need, then it's not likely our product is going to assist them. But in reality, most kids are not getting that. And that is the reason why supplementing their diet with our product can actually achieve their optimal height. And this is the slide that is really most important. You can see here that on average, kids grew taller over the control group in a prospective randomized double blind placebo study of 200 children the study was conducted in Israel. All the kids were in the three to nine year old space. I might add that all the children in this study all fell within the lowest quartile of growth. And that's important to say that I'm not suggesting that this product is gonna work for every child, but the lowest quartile of, of kids in, in, at birth 
they tend to be shorter kids, they tend to grow at a slower rate. And when they did this study on those children, which is 25% of all kids effectively that this can be benefit to, they, they actually grew on an average of 30% taller than the kids who received the placebo. And I found that absolutely amazing over a 12 month period. So clearly these children are benefiting in increasing their rate of height and, and growth without an increase in their BMI index. Now this is very, very important for, for kids uh, in terms of achieving their optimum, their optimization. I'm not suggesting that these kids are necessarily gonna grow taller than, than uh, they would ultimately otherwise become. Uh, because we haven't done a study greater than 12 months. But clearly over the 12 month period, they did grow taller than the control group by an average of 30%, which is remarkable. And that's very important for kids when they're going through that development stage, you know, playing in the, in the playground or basketball or sports in general, or just for their, for their self-confidence. So this is a clinically proven product that assists them to grow taller. So the market for this is for the three to nine year old space. Um, they're presently in commercial sales. We've talked about uh, Amazon there. We're, um, we've also got the protein bars as well, which is fully developed. And so these are the products that we're selling in the United States right now. And we also have had our first order out of China. We also have another product in development, which is the junior growth formula. This is effectively for children going through pu uh, puberty. Um, this product is fully developed, but it's currently undergoing its clinical testing. And uh, that is going to be released later, well, either later this year or early next year. We also have another one in development for young athletes. And uh, this is also undergoing clinical testing as well. And that's going to be released. Yeah, I think that's probably not going to be the end of this year. It's going to be earlier next year. The Chinese opportunity is a very big one. Um, we know this from the market research that we've conducted over there. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a huge market. And we have already done our first deal to distribute our product into China. Uh, that, deal, that, that product, to my understanding, has already sold out. So we are now expecting a, follow -up, a following order from the first one that we've already delivered to China. So we're expecting significant sales growth out of there. There's also a, an expanding US opportunity. Um, we're already through Amazon, but we're also looking at getting onto the shelves, particularly in pharmacies and supermarkets. That's the next stage of growth for us in the United States. And there will be news flow with respect to that in the coming months. So in terms of the next 18 months, we have new products that we're going to be adding next year. Um, new sales channels, which is going to be through not just online sales, but also through retail stores. These are going to be the things that will drive the share price moving forward. New territories, so selling into China, expanding in the US. We're also uh, looking to enter into South Korea and, and Europe. And we've recently signed a distribution agreement with the, the Chinese group. So that's, uh, that's the initial order that I mentioned that's already been sold out. So we're expecting a second order soon that we will announce when that occurs. In terms of our roadmap going forward, these are the timelines that we're expecting for the launch of our new products. Um, this is going to be a very busy year next year. There's going to be a lot of announcements, I expect, in respect to sales and, in, and expansion into new markets. So this is going to be an exciting period for shareholders to come on that journey with us. So our board of directors, um, I've talked about uh, Laurent, she's actually a corporate lawyer. Um, she's excellent to work with. And um, myself, I've actually been in the healthcare space for some years. I've floated a number of companies that I've either founded or co-founded. They've all done very, very well. And 
I'd like to think that nutritional growth solutions will outshine all of them. Um, we also have other directors, you can see their profiles there. I'll mention Anton Yuvarov, he's uh, also based in Perth with me. Um, he's also a biotech entrepreneur. He's been involved in the founding of a number of companies and um, he also worked with me when I was chairman of Oz Biotech in Western Australia and he was a co-director of mine and Anton have actually and I have founded uh, two, a couple of companies already together. So in summary, we are unique. That's what's most important for me, that we are actually scientifically formulated in this space. Uh, there aren't any other products that make the claims that we have that are backed with um, scientific evidence to show that we can increase the height of, or the rate of growth for children's height. This is a huge market for us and uh, we are targeting new markets in the um, expanding in the US and China and also in Southeast Asia and Europe. We've got already established distribution channels. We're going to expand on those. We've got a new range of products which is going to expand our brand. We're covered by an insurance billing code in the United States, which is very important. And we're not really bound by the same strict regulatory requirements of infant formulas in China. So that's the uh, company presentation in a snapshot. We've only been listed for a few weeks. I think we've got a very exciting journey ahead of us. If I was to suggest to investors where, where they should look for key milestones, it should effectively be expanding in China, uh, in terms of the next sales order, moving into new sales channels in the United States, particularly getting onto shelves in pharmacies or supermarkets, that's going to be a big kicker for us. Moving into um, Europe will be also a major opportunity for us. So these, uh, and I might add as well that in terms of online sales, um, you know, we could potentially partner with key influencers. So there are many, many opportunities for us that are lining up for the company moving into next year. And um, if there's any inquiries about the company, my number is on the bottom of every company announcement and I'm always available to talk to all investors. And thank you, Mark. Cheers. Thanks, Brian. We've got a good few questions after coming in, so I'll just maybe rattle through them. Um, the first one, um, where is the product actually made? Is it made in Israel and then distributed uh, where needed? Or do you outsource manufacturing into the local markets? So the company's product is actually manufactured in Ohio in the United States. Okay. And it's, it's packaged there. But then for the China, so that's where the U.S. product is distributed. Um, but for the Chinese market, we're actually we're actually sending the, the products are still manufactured in Ohio, but it's sent to New Zealand packaged there. And then from New Zealand, it's sent to China. Okay, great. And then um, uh, typical gross margins on the product? Um, I can't say the exact growth margin. Um, we haven't disclosed that, but I'll say that they're, they're very, they're, they're, they're substantive. There is a there is a large growth there is a large profit margin on the product. It is a premium product. It's premium because it's clinically tested and proven. Okay. And then another question around the go to market strategy. Do you need pediatric physicians to to recommend the, the product, or are you going to be doing a big consumer marketing push, or is it a combination of the two? Well, it's already recommended by pediatricians. It was developed by pediatricians. Um, but in terms of um, marketing and promotion, I mean, we already used the fact that it was developed and created by pediatricians as part of our promotional piece. But I think that this is not a crowded space. When you look at um, you know, baby formula market, I mean, it's a very crowded one. But when you, but if you think about the three to nine year old space, that's not particularly crowded at all. So I think we stand out as a company that actually looks at not just pediatrics between the ages of zero and two, but children between the ages of three and nine, and then moving into 10 year olds and pubescents. So this is a, um, this is a, a space that I think we're going to own completely going forward. And then maybe I think it's more just to clarify, um, what exactly does 
uh, NGSO in here, i.e. who owns the product IP? Is NGS licensing the product off an offshore parent? Um, I can't remember which slide it was, but basically it's NGS's IP, if I'm correct. Yes, it's completely owned by NGS. Okay, great. And, and I might add it was developed through the Schneider Institute, but the Schneider Institute are the largest shareholders of the company. Okay, great. And they're also S grade. Okay. And then uh, uh, distribution agreements, um, the preferred model to for go to market. I mean, you're not going to build a, a consumer products business. Um, a, a market entries are going to be through distribution, either exclusive or non-exclusive basis. Well, we'll certainly focus on non-exclusive distribution agreements. That's what we've been doing to date. So uh, our distribution agreement in China is non-exclusive. Uh, so we will be expanding into those markets with, with, with new partners that we'll have for distribution agreements. And you'll see more announcements in respect to new partnerships. Okay, great. Okay, I think, let me just double check. I've gone through everything there, yeah. And I've done my email questions. Okay, Brian, um, thank you very much for that presentation. And thanks to everyone for joining us this morning on this latest edition of the Copy Microcaps Morning Meeting. As I said, it is being recorded um, and it will be up on the on the YouTube channel probably by um, uh, late afternoon tomorrow if anybody watches to watch it back. Oh, I think we have one last question, Brian, if you want to take it. Sure, please. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess it's on, I guess it's on scale and uh, how much uh, you can grow sales. I think maybe that's a qu a, a question around um, manufacturing capacity. Obviously, you know if you get a a good run in the in the US in terms of initial sales, uh, like how quickly you can scale up manufacturing to to meet demand. Well, we already have a manufacturing facility in Ohio. So that can be geared up to manufacture on a huge scale, but that obviously takes capital investment on our part. And so the $7 million that we raised was really to allow us to be able to gear up for the huge demand that we're anticipating. But part of the good management of the company is making sure that we, we manage our cash flow. And so we don't want to just go and manufacture off the scale um, straight up but at the same time we want to make sure that we have sufficient reserves ready to meet instant demand so um, when we do get these orders and we are getting orders now we want to be able to meet those orders in a timely fashion so that is really part of the reason why the uh, the capital raise was important for us so we could gear up and meet those demands as they come and then a, a final one, if we can, Brian, since we still have a bit of time. Sure. Um, the, the shelf life on the products, uh, what's that like? Um, it's, I can't tell you off the top of my head, but it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a dry powder form. So these typically have long shelf lives. Okay. Okay, great. Okay, uh, if that is the final question, I think we, we will leave it there uh, uh, at this point. Brian, thank you very much uh, again for joining us from Porto. I know it's very early in the morning, your side, um, compared to nearly 10 o'clock now, uh, Sydney time. As I said, the recording will be be up. Um, as Brian said, any, if you want any further information, just check any of the ASX announcements, Brian's contact details at the end of every announcement. Uh, and with that, uh, I, I'll end this morning's Coffee Microcaps morning meeting uh, and let everybody uh, get on with the rest of their day. Thank you, Brian. All right. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for having me. Thank you.